The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. There was a story with Rav Levi, by Ditchev, and he was a mile. Rav Levi was a mile. And he used to do bris meal on children. No. One time, his daughter gave birth to his grandson. And it came in the morning. And the Rav Levi used to do the mila the first thing in the morning. Came in the morning. And all the chassidim came. And they finished davening. And they went to the house of his daughter to be mile his grandson. And they had everything ready. And Rav Levi, who was very into doing the mitzvah, always doing a mitzvah as fast as you can... He told everybody, you have to wait. I'll be back. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. And he went into his room and he closed the door and he didn't come out for four hours. So they're all sitting there with the baby. All the people came for the bris and the, and the party, right? And the Rebbe, who usually is in a big rush, he's in a room. He doesn't come out for four hours. No. So everyone was starting to go crazy. They were losing their patience. When is he going to come out? Anyway, so they were losing their minion. They didn't have a minion left. So finally, there was mamish like 12 people left. And Rev. Levy came out of his room. And he was happy with a big smile on his face. And he did a bris milah on the child. And he got up to name the child. Now, of course, when you name the child, so the father of the baby whispers into the person who's giving the name, the name. But Rev. Levy didn't wait. His own son-in-law, he didn't wait to hear what name he wanted to give. He named the kid on his own, Yehuda Leib. Which was not right. You have to ask the father what name you want to give, right? Okay, so his son-in-law went over to him. He was very upset. And he had a different name. He wanted to give a different name. The Rebbe gave him a name without asking him. So he was quiet. He was a good son-in-law. And after the Milo... So his son law came over to me and said, Rabbi, i got to ask you two questions. One, why did you make us wait for four hours? That's not like you. And two, why did you call me Yehuda Leib? Who's Yehuda Leib? I don't know any Yehuda Leib. You just come up and give my son a name? Where, where did that come from? So he said the following story. He said, when I was coming to your house, I saw a black cloud. And I saw that in this black cloud, there was something going on. A rash gadol. Big, big disturbance. Something was going on in that cloud. So he said, I, I did it. I, I went into this room and I wanted to see what's going on. What's, what's going on in this cloud? So I went into whatever the Rebbe did to get into his uh, Kabbalah state. And he said, I went to the other side of the curtain in Shemayim. And I said, what's going on? What's the tumult? And they said, down on earth, a big tzaddik just died. And his name was Rabbi Yehuda Leib from the city of Apta. And there were many tzaddikim that were coming out of Gan Eden to meet him with, with tupim, macholos, with, with tambourines, whatever that means. Because they said a big tzaddik is now coming to Gan Eden, Rabbi Yehuda Leib, Apta. Now we know that every tzaddik, no matter who you are, when you, when you leave this world, even if you're going to Gan Eden, you have to go through Gehenna. The way to get Hayden, to get Hayden, is through Gehenna. Not that you have to, that, the, that the tzaddik has to go through the fire of Gehenna. It's sort of like a bridge. You have to go over Gehenna. Why does the tzaddik have to go, what do you do? Why does he have to go over Gehenna? Because even though he's a big tzaddik, maybe he could have saved some of those people that were in Gehenna. So even on his way to Gan Eden, a Jew has to see the other Jews that are suffering. Now you take an unbelievable lesson. As great as you are, you deserve to go to Gan Eden, but you need to see your brethren that's suffering. Because maybe, maybe if you would have reached out, you would have saved one of them. So there's a little pain, even for the biggest tzaddik when he goes to Gan Eden, because he has to see his brothers suffering. Understand? It's like, that's how much we have to be into each other's suffering, how we have to feel and care about other Jews. Anyway, so the, the, the Rav, the Rebbe, is watching this whole thing. And he sees this big tzaddik of Yehuda Leib from Apta. He's, he's walking across this bridge to go to Gan Eden. And all of a sudden, he jumps off the bridge into Gehenna. Rabbi Yehuda Leib jumped into Gehenna. Now, Rabbi Yehuda Leib was a big tzaddik. There can't be a fire. So the minute he jumped into Gehenna, they had to turn off all the fires. 
So the whole Gehenna became quiet. So now, the, the Malach of Gehenna said, <laughs> get out of here. I got, I got to have these fires on. You can't jump into get my Gehenna with that Rishus. What are you doing in my Gehenna? I need to turn the fires on. I can't turn the fires. Get out of here. So he said, he said, I'm not getting out of here. Listen to this. I'm not getting out of here until I take Jewish souls with me out of hell to Ganadin, to heaven. So the said, who do you think you are? Who, who gave you Rishus to come to my, to my place of business where I have all these souls and you're telling me that you're not leaving until you take souls with you? I'm not giving you a melody. No, I'm no way. So, <laughs> so he said, okay, I'm not leaving. So we're at a standstill. Meanwhile, the fires of Gehenna are off. And all the people that were suffering are not suffering anymore. So the monarch realized he had a problem here. This, this rabbi is not leaving until he takes some souls with him. So he was, of course, who does he work for? He works for the Satan. Who does the Malach? They're all partners, guys. They get you to do that. They're, they're, they're very nice guys. They tell you they're your friend. They get you to look on the screen that you're not supposed to look at or look at the girl crossing the street. And they're saying like, hey, 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 you saw that? Yeah, huh? Let's go do an Avera, right? And I'm your best friend. And don't worry about it. That's the same Satan that runs up, rats on you right away to God. You know what he did? 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 Right? And then he takes you and puts you into Gehenna. This is your buddy. So the Satan ran to Hashem and said, we got a problem. There's a rabbi in the middle of hell. And he's not getting out. And the fires are off. And the fires are supposed to be on. We want him out, Hashem. <coughs> and the, 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 the Rav said, uh, I already made a promise. I made an there That I'm not leaving here until I take people with me. So they had a problem now. You can't make the Rav break his nether. So Akash Baruch Hu said like this. God said, listen. If his word wasn't the word on this world that we're in right now. And he lied. And he made up things. So then we can make him break his promise in that world. So we're gonna, even though he promised he's not gonna leave Gehenna until he takes souls with him, we can make him a liar. Because he is a liar. Because in this world he lied. But if the whole time he was in this world, this rabbi, nephew who delayed, never ever said a lie, then we're not allowed to make him lie in this world either. Because he's a truthful person. So let's open up his books. And let's see if he ever lied when he lived on earth. And as it says, they checked him out, and they found that he never lied. So Kosh Baruch Hu said, being that he never lied, he can't, we can't make him a liar here, and therefore, the Malach, you have to let him take souls out of Gehenna. Okay? So the question is, how many? So they asked Hashem, how many does he get? God said, Let's open up the book of how many people he saved on this world. However many Jews he saved in this world, we'll let him save in that world. So they looked it up and they found that he saved 220. 220 Jews he saved. So they gave him permission to save 200. And you know what that means? 220 souls that were in hell. Free of charge. You could take out why? Because he never lied. And on this world he saved 220 souls. No, Master Rabbi Yehuda Leib. So what did Rabbi Yehuda Leib say? The Malach came back and the Malach said, Okay, you win. We can't make you a liar because you weren't a liar in this world. We can't make you a liar in the other world. Okay, you can take out. God said 220. Yorad Bamada Hashvi. He went down to the seventh level in Gehenna. Everyone thinks that you can only spend 11 months in Gehenna. That's on certain levels, but there's a level called the Tehoim of Gehenna, the bottom of Gehenna, which is the seventh level, which you're there forever. Those are life. They get, they're lifers. They're stuck in Gehenna, I'm, whatever, maybe one day I'll tell you they have various, they get a person into that place, but that's a place with Kaddish, with yard site, with everything you can do, they're stuck, they can't get out. That's where they're stuck for life. It's life imprisonment. So he went, who the Leib said, what am I going to do? I'm going to take out Nefashis, the Shamas that are going to get out after 11 months. That's silly. So he went down to the seventh level of Gehenna, and he took out two, well, we'll see what he took out. So he goes there, 
instead of taking 220 out of the seventh level, he takes 440. He was only allowed to take 220. He took 440. Okay? No, he comes to the gate. So the Malach of Yehadim says to him, Ma'ata what are you doing? You took double. So they went back to Shemayim and they said to Hashem, uh, you said 220, he took 440. So listen to what Baruch said. So now we have to look into his book again and see why he only saved 220. If he only saved 220 because he died young and because he didn't have enough money to save more and he really wanted to save more, then you have to let him save double. If he was happy with himself and he said, wow, I saved so many people, I don't need to do it anymore, then he can't take more than 220. They went and they looked and they saw that his biggest sar of being sick and dying was that he wasn't able to save more. That he was dying. If you gave me more years and more money, I could save more people. That's why he didn't want to die. Not because he wanted to go to another movie. He wanted another glass of grape juice or a bottle of beer or another cigarette. He didn't want to die because he wanted to save more Jews. So Hashem said, if that's the reason, then you have to let him take double. And Kachaya, he took 440 neshamas, 440 souls from the deepest part of Gehenna, and he brought them into Ghana then. Why was he able to do that, boys? Because his word was a word. A person's word has to be a word. If you want Hashem's word to be a word, your word has to be a word. That's the way it is. Because everything is mida. If you're MS, then everything around you is MS. Because Baruch Hu word is a word. It doesn't change. But if you want His word, if you want Him to give you a bracha, and Rosh Hashanah, you want Him to put you in the Sefer HaChayim, then your word has to, you have to be honest. You have to, your word has to be a word. If your word is not a word, so then when you dive in, who says your word is a word? They're going to say, in business he was a crook. So how can we trust in what he's saying? I love you, Hashem, with my whole heart, my whole soul. Yeah, he's full of baloney. He's sketching. He's trying to sell you something, Hashem. His word's not a word. A person's word has to be a word. And if your word is a word on this world, it gives you a very big koyach on the next world. I was invited three years ago to a community where they were having a huge problem in a shul that everybody was talking. And they said that they had all kinds of rabbis that got up and spoke. Halacha is Mishnah you're not allowed to talk by davening. The importance of not talking by davening, the lack of Derek Eretz of talking by davening, the chutzpah to Hashem to be talking by davening. And no matter what rabbi got up, Rabbi Wallerstein, they still talk. So we're inviting you to come and to stop the talking. I'm like, what am I going to say that these other rabbis didn't say? So now we heard you're, you're tough. You got to come in, you got to let them have it. So I started preparing and I looked at all the svarim. There's a crazy amount of swarm on, on the destruction of talking and what it does and everything else. And I, and I was like, they heard this already. They heard this already. Anyway, Hashem sent me a little message, and this is what I told them. It took me five minutes. Baruch Hashem, it's now two years or three years, and there is no talking in this show. There's no talking in this show at all. I'll tell you what I told them. I said, listen to me. Ladies and men, because the ladies were talking on the side of the Nashim, and the men were talking on the side of the men. They weren't talking to each other, but the women were talking to the women. The men were I told them the following. I said, listen. I said, one day you're not going to be in this world anymore. You're going to have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. Well, hope you die after you have great-great-grandchildren. you live till you're 90 and 100 years old. I said, they're going to bury you in Hamanuchos in Israel. Maybe Hazesim, maybe New Jersey. Wherever, wherever they're going to bury you, they're going to bury you. He said, you're going to have this beautiful granddaughter. And she's going to have problems finding a shidduch. So she's going to go, Eric Yom Kippur, to her Zaydi's grave. And she's going to cry, Zaydi, Zaydi, please, Zaydi, I love you. Go to Shemayim, you're such a tzaddik. Go talk to Hashem, I need to get married. I'm 33 years old, and I can't find the shidduch. Zaydi, Zaydi, I have no children. Go in front of the kisei I covered. Bobby, my grandmother, Safta, Saba. Go to Hashem and daven for me. I can't have children. I don't have, I can't make a parnasa. There's a whole sefer called Shari Dima. All these different prayers. You go to your father's grave, your grandfather's grave, your grandmother's grave. 
I said, and you're going to see your grandchildren standing by your grave. They're going to bring you the Shema down. And they're going to be begging you, go in front of Hashem, help me. I can't make a part. No, so I can't get married. I can't have children. And you, because the Shema is emotion. That's what, we, what it's made out of. It's your grandchild or maybe your child. And you're going to go up and you're going to say, to the Malach, I want to go in front of Hashem. I have a granddaughter. She's 33 years old. She's not married. I have a child married 12 years. They don't have children. And they're asking me to go to Hashem. I want to go to Hashem right now and I want to beg him. I'm close. I'm up here. And the mom's going to say, you? You can't go to Hashem. When you were supposed to go to Hashem, you were busy talking. Now you can't go to Hashem. person who talks in shul, it says, can't go in front of the Kisra Kavar. I said, this, this neshama is already out of hell, out of Gehenna, 30 years. Now it's right back into Gehenna. Because to see its grandchild or its child or its great-grandchild davening, that that neshama should go in front of Hashem and daven, and the malachim are never going to let you get near Hashem. You are the chutzpah, that when it came to davening, you were talking. Now you want to daven? Go talk. Go to your friends and talk. To Hashem, you're not talking. I said, is there anyone in this room that feels that talking in shul is worth losing your voice in the next world? Not having a lips, not having a mouth, not having a tongue. Not being able to, to daven for Klai Yisrael, to daven for your children, for your wife, whatever, whoever you have to daven for. You're in the next world. This is the biggest Gehenna. Because you spoke here, you can't speak there. Oh, yeah. Mida, can I get Mida? It brings down. That was the end of that. Because every person that sits, says, okay, I'm a big mouth. I love to talk, but I'm not going to do this to my children, my grandchildren. I want to have the power that after 120 years, I'll be in Shemayim, that, I, that, I, that, I, that in Shul I never spoke, that I'll have the power to daven to Hashem, to have that closest with Hashem in the next world. If you talk by davening, you're going to lose it. Speech is a very precious thing. Look at the power that we see over here, that by speaking, he had the koyach of, of pulling out, you know what that is? 440 souls from the deep of the deep of hell. It's amazing, amazing story. Therefore, said Rav Yitzhak Halevi to his son-in-law, when I saw this Rav, this Yehuda Lev, Me'apta, when I saw that he was so great that he had the power of pulling out 440 in the Shabbos, of course, that's the name I wanted to give to my grandson, and that's why it took me four hours. I was watching this whole thing unfold. And that's why I gave this name to my grandson. Boy, speech, speech. You have to be so careful what comes out of your mouth. That's why Akash Baruch Hu gave us two guards on our mouth. Everything else has one guard. You have your eyelids. You have your earlobes. But your mouth has to have teeth and lips because it's such a dangerous thing that they had to put, it's such a precious thing, Dibor, that they had to put two gates on it. The more precious, you know, you have a, if you have money in the house, jewelry, so you put it in a safe, and then you put a picture on top of that, and it's in the closet with your clothes on top of the closet, right? The more, the more it's worth, the more, so that if you want to look at your body and see what is the most valuable part of your body. So if you want to know the most valuable part of your body, you look for the part of your body that has the most safeguards, because that must be the most valuable part of your body. What part of your body has the most safeguards? Your mouth. It has lips, and it has teeth. It has two sha'arim. Two gates. So that is talking the most powerful thing. You could talk by davening and ruin everything, and you could daven by davening and kol kol yakov. That's our, that's our strength. Teal is our strength. Our mouth is our strength. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.